Let's call the order at 17. Okay. Uh, do we have any adjustments? To the do we have any adjustments to the agenda? All right. Um, and then uh, we'll move to the consent agenda. Um, to approve the minutes of Tuesday, January 17th. Um, to approve the minutes of Thursday, February 9th. To the minutes of Tuesday, December 20th. And uh, November 29th. Special view and presentation. Uh, sure. individually yeah. however, however, I think you can do them as a group. We well, can't. I, I know that I would like to amend the minutes of the special meeting on the board. Yeah. 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 We talked about it. Yeah. 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 Oh, and how you did. Even though you weren't there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you were the one that uh, Right. No, I know we didn't approve them, but I thought we amended them. Oh, we might have amended them. I thought there was an amendment in there, but I wanted Chris to. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, do you, want our, you requested an amendment. Amendment. Yeah. They, Why don't we approve? Do you want to make a motion to approve the minutes that aren't seven? Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I didn't see anything wrong with the other ones. Um, so I'd make a motion to approve the minute, meeting minutes of January 17th, February 9th, and December 20th as written. Yeah. We have a second? I'll second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay. And then I, I think we, we had talked about it briefly, um, I don't know, it was, I think it was two meetings ago about the meeting minutes of the um, 29th special meeting. So I, I think, so the way it's written right now on, under the actions of possible actions was uh, 5.1 was, you know, that uh, Chris Jarvis had motion, uh, motioned that the public findings is our that the conflict of interest complaint is not supported by evidence provided and therefore the complaint, the complaint be dismissed. And, and that's very accurate. But the other piece of that, that was talked about at length with uh, three of the four select board member, voting members that night was that even though um, we did not believe that any conflict of interest um, warranted in this case, but we did, um, all three members had talked about um, that the personal conduct of the board member was not not appropriate. Um, one board member had made the comments that, um, that the comments were inappropriate, in poor taste, and bad judgment. Another one was uh, uh, that they couldn't support the way in which our board member expressed themselves in the public, and that, and that the comments were highly offensive. And I don't think we have. To, I don't think we have to get detailed on it. I just think we need to put something in the meeting minutes just to how we came to, you know, like tonight we're going to talk about, you know, the conduct policy um, draft again. So, so there was some, um, some discussion that was had around this um, on how we got here. So I don't know how we put it in there. I think it could be just as simple as saying that, you know, that uh, even though we found it of interest in this case, um, I don't know if you say a quorum or, but there was three of the four members that night that had um, common language of that the personal conduct by the board member was unacceptable or something like that. Okay. I mean, do you have language you want to? Well, I, I guess I don't know the exact language because, I mean, I went back, looked at the work and media, you know, thing. I mean, everybody said something different, but they're all kind of cooled in the same. Do you have anything? Just looking at um, I, I think we. I would just. I would say at the end of so five one the first uh, sentence there with with myself making the motion um, up through. Therefore, the complaint would be dismissed. I think we should just add, you know, that um, majority of the board believe that the personal conduct of the board member was unbecoming or something like that. Okay. Because um, then we did talk about the next one possible 
a further you know discussion sure. on the policy and things like that. Board members request the future discussion on the board conduct and code of ethics policies for the board. Is there any other board members have comments on this? Well, I guess I'm okay with it being added in, yeah. Okay. I think it just makes the bridge from the discussion to the board conduct and code of ethics discussion you know after and right. if you're looking at it yeah it's this one yeah, yeah um five one yeah so it makes a bridge from from here to here i mean i i, I let me just, just add after dismiss the complaint board mm -hmm. members um agree uh, conduct was, I don't know, what's the appropriate word? I, I was just using that the personal conduct of the board member um, was unbecoming. I guess that's what I heard down. Yeah, sure. sure. So. I would ask to amend that to unprofessional. I don't believe unbecoming is necessarily an adjective that you can put in minutes as the clerk. That's fine. So board agreed conduct was unprofessional it or but not a conflict of interest or um, I think we just leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. So board agreed conduct was unprofessional. We already said that it wasn't a conflict of interest. Right. Yeah. This is after dismissed. Um, after dismissed. Okay. Complaint dismissed. Board agreed. Okay. Um, so why don't you make a motion adding that sentence to 5 1 in the minutes and then we'll agree that's an agreement. Okay. So just um, make a motion that we approve the meeting minutes of the 29th with the amendment um, after. Um, complaint may uh, complaint be dismissed that that the board agreed that the conduct was unprofessional of the board member. Okay. I'll do conduct of the board member was unprofessional. Anyway. All right. Do we have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. All right, the minutes are accepted. Do we have any public comments at this time? I'd like to say that that was, a, I have no vote on that one. Okay. Sorry. In the minutes. So there's one abstention. But what, uh, I guess no, a technicality is, I, I don't know if she would, would she be voting for that because it was uh, she had to, amendments to, to meeting minutes that are about your ex-wife's complaint to the board. So if we want to go into this for hours, we can. I think it's well time that this should be over. Do you want to be recused or abstention? Abstention? All right. Since I was partly responsible for clearing these minutes as the clerk, I want to vote no. Oh, you're going to vote no. Okay. Correct. Got it. Three. Okay. Sorry about the confusion. All right. Public comments. Introduce yourself. Ned Sullivan. And we'll be running for school board. <clears throat> I'd like to make a public statement saying that I think the change in language is overly punitive and possibly not just. Um, the removal of the conflict of interest, once that was out of the way, I think that that's all it needed. And I think that this issue is way too convoluted between the parties that are participating to have any more discussion about it. And I want to just say I object to that happening. Tonight. Thank you. 
Is there any other public comment? Okay, any Just, board? And that's general public comment? Yeah. Not about the issue. Right. That you just did. General public. Just curious. Yeah. Um, board comments. Any board comments? I, I think uh, one thing that uh, kind of going through my uh, uh, BCA type duties here at the last week, you know, for the election, one thing that was brought up in length last night at um, our BCA meeting in Bethel was, again, some of the some of the way that the school voting is structured right now. And so, for instance, I think we really need to look in further sessions this coming year of taking in the um, uh, the chart, the, the new articles of origination, and really look at those and see if they're all working for us. And and the example I'll I'll use is the um, the um, the the state isn't too keen on commingling of ballots. What that means is the way it's written into the articles of origination right now is that Bethel votes in Bethel, Royalton votes in Royalton, but then ballots from each town are brought to the SU mm -hmm. to then be counted together. So uh, the state doesn't like that. They call it commingling of ballots when the ballots have to be driven from sure. one location to another to be counted. So, and, and there's, we talked about a little bit there at the last meeting. There's these nuances and uh, that were put in that maybe we ought to take a look at, like, you know, does Bethel just vote for Bethel? Does Royalton just vote for Royalton? Because right now you have Royalton votes for Bethel, Bethel votes for Royalton, you know. So there's a lot of a lot of pieces that that maybe there's an opportunity for us to look at, and um, there's definitely some pieces of it that are um, uh, tough on the BCA members to to do their job. So yeah, I can see how that would be difficult to do the commingling. You know, I think the idea of it was when there are issues that are either contentious or could be contentious, you know, when you see like, well, it didn't pass in this town, but it did pass in that town, then it winds up causing more conflict. You know? Yeah. Whereas, like if there was a way of just counting separately, but then even reporting just a single number, I think that that would be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wonder now that we've had several years now, maybe it's an opportunity for us over the next 10 months or so to kind of, sure. like we've talked about, looking at our policies, but also looking at our articles of origination and seeing what's working and what may, may need some adjustments um, or what we'd have to put on the warning for next year. Right? Yeah, we can we can look at that in. Because you wouldn't be able to make any adjustments until it was warned and voted on. Yeah. Um, okay. Is there any other board comment? Then we'll move on to um, so there's the summer 2023 EI HVAC heating, lighting, and control panel or controls project. Hey everyone, I'm Eric Latvia. Uh, skip this one. Skip this one. <laughs> You guys have seen enough of that slide. I've shown it like five times already. So um, the numbers actually came out closer to what um, what we had originally anticipated. The numbers were up a little bit, but overall, um, you know, I think we're capturing all of the original scope that we wanted to do in the project and what we wanted to accomplish with the job. So still looking at, you know, we're going to be removing the underground fuel oil tank out here. Um, installing three underground LP tanks that would be located essentially kind of in between your existing generator and your barn out back on the right hand side. <clears throat> um, adding a, uh, it says pellet boiler, but it's actually a chip boiler. So it's a wood chip boiler, which um, gains you guys a little bit. Uh, they cost more money up front, but they, they're cheaper fuel as you guys move forward. So um, the pellets are really nice at the other schools. They're smaller schools. It's less of an investment, a smaller footprint. But due to the size of these schools, 50,000 square feet, you're right on that border. So it made more sense to go with a wood chip, um, which is why you actually see a little bit more savings on the fuel savings aspect of it because wood chips um, are cheaper per therm than it would be per pellet just because you know pellets have that additional refining process that it takes to actually create them. Um, 
still converting steam to hydronic. So essentially everything that's in between your guys' main middle school entrance and this new little addition of the library section is all existing steam, as well as all the, the horseshoe around your guys' kind of existing gymnasium. <coughs> so all that part is still running off your existing steam build uh, system. All that would get removed. All the piping would get demoed. Um, all new radiation in the classroom. So it's going to look pretty similar to what you guys have now. It's just going to be a basic kind of off-white, light commercial um, radiation that would go underneath all the windows. Um, we'd be adding um, coils to your guys' energy recovery units, so your ventilation units. Um, upgrading uh, all the lights. So these lights that you guys see right now, um, which are currently... <coughs> Um, mounted below the ceiling grid would become recessed lighting, so they go up above the grid. Um, probably cutting down on the total number of fixtures in these spaces that are a little bit over lamped. Um, so still doing the LED lighting upgrade throughout the whole school. Um, asbestos abatement is really just dedicated to um, what is uh, your guys breaching off of your existing steam boilers. So you guys have about 20 feet of um, this insulation that goes on the the jacket of the breaching, which is the exhaust of your boilers, that will need to get removed with the new pellet system. And then some of your guys' existing steam piping around the gym and some other areas has um, some fittings that came up positive as well. Um, so our goal is not, this is not an asbestos abatement project. There's a handful of asbestos that I have to abate in order for us to complete our work. So that's really what that money is in there for. And then the DDC control system is really just an extension off of your guys' existing control system. So you guys actually have a pretty robust control system, specifically like in the elementary school wing and even in these spaces in here. Um, what's not has any real control is um, your guys' center classrooms that we're going to be repiping and putting all new um, hydronic in. So I just like noticing today when I came in here, you know, some things that we kind of want to address, like, there's no ventilation going on right now. So having the ability to go easily into like a DDC system and spaces that get used off hours, libraries, gymnasiums, having a button in there so you can add ventilation when you guys are utilizing the space. And for instance, I just noticed all of your ventilation is going wild in all of your classrooms right now going down through here. So if you walk through the classrooms, you can see like the flags kind of waving in the air and it's, you know, 7.30 at night, kids haven't been here for four hours. So part of the DDC control and getting this place really dialed in is updating all the schedules and just making sure that we have equipment running when it should be and not have equipment running when it's not supposed to be. Savings, um, we're looking at 63000 on the fuel switch. So that's um, based on $4 a gallon oil that we're seeing about right now. You guys consume just under 30,000 gallons a year at this campus. Um, Ellie, and then the, there is some savings, um, maintenance savings as well. So you're about 55,000 in true energy savings. Um, and then the remaining is um, the deferred, the maintenance that you guys would have to be putting into your age system at this point. Um, LED lighting is similar. Um, I think about, I want to say 18 to 17, 17 or 18,000 of that is true energy savings. The remaining is some, some maintenance stuff that you won't have to deal with anymore. And then that control system is optimizing the schedules and cutting back. So that's a mixture of both um, energy fuel savings and electrical savings that we're going to be able to get by optimizing your guys' DDC system. Um, grants, we have the, the state of Vermont wood heat grant for $250,000. That's going to help pay for the biomass system. Um, we're getting rebates from Efficiency Vermont of $30,000 to be converting to biomass. And then they're giving 46279 towards the LED lighting conversion. So that's the Bethel campus. Next slide. Row opens easy. It's just a lighting upgrade. <clears throat> but it's the same thing. I mean, spaces that already had LED lighting that have been upgraded, there's not many. Um, there might be a couple rooms. Those would essentially remain. Any space like this that has lights that is hung below the ceiling grid would go to recess unless there's not space up above the ceiling. And then we would go with essentially like a more modern looking style of this. Um, closets, areas that don't get high usage um, would just be bulb replacements, but all of your classrooms, administrative spaces, libraries, gymnasiums, anyone, any space that's occupied on a regular basis would receive um, a new LED light. Everyone will have um, 
motion occupancy sensors built into them. They're going to be able to be programmed on your, your iPhone or any Bluetooth connected device. Um, there's apps associated with it so we can make adjustments to the brightness in the spaces. They'll all have dimmer switches. Um, it'll be a nice upgrade. Same thing, pretty significant savings here from a kilowatt hour standpoint. Um, and then a nice efficiency Vermont rebate as well at 50905 One thing that's going to come up um, is when we do this lighting upgrade at Royalton, it's going to drop you guys below your current PPA, your current power purchase agreement that you guys have with the solar company right now. Um, I did confirm with them that those solar credits can get transferred over here to this Bethel campus. So I think it's just something that we're going to have to look at as it goes along. Um, but they can transfer credits up to four times a year. Um, so if you guys, and then those credits that you guys bank are good for upwards of a year. So some of the things that we're talking about at the Royalton campus down the road is um, adding additional ventilation to your guys' library and cafeteria and possibly doing that with heat pump technology, which would probably add cooling, which would be an additional electrical load that you guys aren't utilizing right now. So. I think it's just something that uh, we're going to have to sit there and watch and see where the power bills come in at to some extent. And then we'll have to work with um, Greenback <laughs> Capital, which currently owns that solar array, <clears throat> and they handle the credits. Um, and then we'll have to make some adjustments just transferring some of those credits over here. Um, so next slide. Total contract price was what you guys would be contracting with EEI of $2,181,500. This is the state of Vermont wood heat grant that I had shown in the Bethel campus. The efficiency Vermont wood heat, uh, these are two different ones. So the, this, is a, this is a grant, this is um, efficiency Vermont rebate. So grant rebate, and then this is the lighting rebate. This is what the school district, the SU has, um, contributed of their ESSER funds, 310,000. So that puts the unified district's responsibility of 1,494,316. We're looking at a 15 year lease at just below 5%, but I'm running my numbers at roughly 5% of 1,225,000, which leaves this district having to put their own capital funds in of 269,316 but it does get you guys that um, cost-neutral cost uh, operating budget. So you're looking at annual savings of you know, $116,000 a year with uh, lease payments of $117,000. So there's a $500 difference between the two. So that's, that's the project. And uh, at this point, we do have it you know, fully designed. We're moving right along with the permitting process because I kind of had to move forward with that because there's some Act 250 amendments that we needed here in order to get the silo installed in the back. You know, those are all costs that we're just, you know, doing at risk that we've done so far, hoping that you guys eventually approve this project and we can move forward with it. So, um, but at this time, everything looks good here. I mean, from a schedule standpoint, it'd be one of those things where the goal would be by the end of this summer, we'd be out of all the classrooms, all your radiation would be up, all the piping would be back into the mechanical room. And then really, you know, the boiler should be up and running by, um, at least the propane boilers, the goal would be, those things would be up and running by probably mid-September. And then your pellet boiler would be coming on um, probably by mid-October, beginning of November time -like. Um New water heaters are part of this proposal as well. I don't know if I made that clear, but you guys do have some oil-fired water heaters that I have to get rid of because we're getting rid of your oil system. So there we're looking at doing a combination of um, heat pump water heater. So in the summertime, you guys would utilize a heat pump water heater. Um, and then in the wintertime, we would do, you know, like a, a storage tank water heater, similar to an indirect one with that would, uh, would be tied into your pellet boiler. So you're kind of getting like the best of both worlds because the heat pump works really good in the summer when you're taking that excess heat out of the air. Um, doesn't work as good in the wintertime and then you get the cheap water heating from the pellet system in the winter. And those would all be tied into your DDC control system as well. Um, that's it, I did give Parker a couple motions. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about the project and where we're at. So when we met last, I think it was in December, when we were, we did a walkthrough and, and you had mentioned it, you know, we talked about the, 
the new um, radiation pieces in the classroom. Yeah. Because we were putting the system in. Would we tie it in with the old pieces or would we put new? It sounds like new. you have all new in this. All new. And, and do you know, because we also talked about that time that we wanted a price for all new, but what would possibly be the savings if we kept the old stuff? Not to say we want to, but we, we had talked about, didn't we, Rodney, that we would have like a an option, add you know that. option if we wanted to keep the old stuff, how much it would be. Um, yeah, I, we did discuss that a little bit. Yeah, we did. I, discuss so I'm that. just curious of what the. I dropped the ball on that one. Chris. What the added is, you know. If I was to guess. Are there about seven? Are there maybe 12, 14 total classrooms? Does that sound right? Yeah. Um, probably talking about $35,000 roughly, thirty-five dollars to $40,000 if you were to eliminate that radiant and reduce the existing that's there. Yeah. Um, and I think at that time, we, well, when I say we, Rodney and myself and can't remember who else was there that day, but you know, if it was within reason, it made sense to do it. Um, I don't. I mean, if it was going to be this astronomical cost, then then maybe we'd have to look yeah. into doing that as a. I don't a, recommend a part B project, but uh, yeah, I don't recommend it. Um, Not for that cost. No, no, and the the so what you guys have now is you guys have these perimeter vaults that run around at least not this portion of the school, but the other steam yeah. portion. So. All of the pipes come up from down uh, underneath, so it would take some pretty major modifications to that existing. I mean, you would save some equipment costs, but it certainly wouldn't look that good. And uh, I do think that what we're proposing is, is certainly the best. Based on what you guys are doing from an infrastructure improvement standpoint, it, it does make a lot of sense to replace this at the same time. So with the vaults, I'm not removing all the existing steam piping in those vaults. Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of everything that we can get access to and get our hands on, but I'm not sending people, you know, a couple hundred feet down these vaults that you can barely crawl through to demo stuff out. So that stuff's going to get abandoned in place. So in these floors and these classrooms down here, we'll cut the pipes flush to the tile and then um, we'll just epoxy the holes with the color to match the existing tile in there. And then what you see, like this is all new radiation. And then what you'll see, Coming out of like the boiler room, there's another little classroom. That existing unit ventilator would stay. Then right after that classroom, you guys have a, uh, a storage area that I think they use. We're adding a unit heater to that space. So that will now become heated, which I think right now they run like an electric heater in there for the most part. We're adding new cabinet unit heaters, which are kind of like your, your ground mounted units that you see at doors as you walk into the space. So you guys have three perimeter doors part of your gym so all those we get cabinet unit heaters um and then a couple of your other little storage spaces would get um unit heaters which are pretty much the same as cabinet ones except for they're the hanging ones that you guys currently have in the spaces um your nurse's office that's in the front here would be getting a new radiant ceiling panel because i think there's some cool some issues with people being cool in that space um and then obviously new radiation for the bathrooms as well trying to clean that up. So um, we're, we're not, I don't have a ton of money in the budget for like painting and cleaning up a lot of stuff outside of it. So this is really a, a heating project. And, um, you know, we're going to run the pipes, as we talked about, kind of up in that little ceiling space that we have in between the existing drop and the top of the windows. Um, and then we're going to run exposed down the corner of each classroom. Chris, can I ask a question? Hi, Andrew. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that presentation. Um, so the stuff you abandoned in the floor in the original part of the building is that um, we won't have a need to be in the floor in that crawl space again, will we? Because I'm, guys, think, I'm thinking there hatches. There are hatches that I've always been concerned about. Yeah. So it's you guys. There. So what happened was. Must be when they built this addition here off the end, they did run some hot water piping back into that steam system. Okay. Which is why, like, you can't, they must have worked their way out of that tunnel, I okay. think is what they did. They started over here and worked their way back into the boiler room because there's no way that, like, you could get in there. Once all four of those pipes are in there, it's, you can't pass through that space anymore. 
So it, you guys will still have to maintain them. You can't just like fill them in and lock those grates, but there's really no need. At that. There's no valves. There's no actuators. Everything's above ground. So there's nothing that you really have to access in those spaces. So it could be sealed, sort of. You could seal it to a greater extent. I mean, I don't, unless you had some kind of catastrophic mm -hmm. error, like, you know, these piping systems last 50 to 100 years, and that is probably oh, 20, God. that hydronics, I don't see it being an issue for a long time. Uh, what, what, have to, uh, what do you do with, the, like, the wood ash, the residue? Oh, uh, that comes from burning it. Um, we put them in big bins at the end of the day, and I got it. I think at some of the other schools, people use them for like in mulch and composting and stuff. Um, I can talk to my, that's a good question, but yeah, you get exposed to somehow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, on a daily basis, someone's yeah. going to, uh, especially in the middle of the winter, you know, not every day, but I think every few days in the middle of the winter, someone's going to be going in, emptying an ash bucket. And then we provide a container inside the mechanical room that's sealed that it goes into. Um, but that's a good question. I actually haven't. Yeah. I don't know what the other schools we, we are. We composted in Sharon. Compost. That's what I think most people do is they compost it. There's not that much of it, though. No, there's not much left at the end of the day. <clears throat> A couple, you know, through the end of the year, you might have three 55-gallon drums filled up with, with ash at the end of the day. Oh. These things are pretty darn efficient. They, okay. When you're pulling these things out every few days, it's a, you know, a two-gallon, like, little bucket that you're just dropping in. So... I mean, the wood ash works wonderful on icy surfaces, too. Yeah, I don't know if you want to be out there sprinkling, but it, it, tracks in it does, it does, it <laughs> does work well. <laughs> I, I did that once. Uh, yeah, so like I said, this is based off a dry pellet system, which definitely burns a little bit cleaner. Um, you know, we have some steps that we have to take through these next few months, setting up some different air monitoring devices. Um, We've set up some indoor air quality monitoring devices already, which is part of the Efficiency Vermont um, ventilation grants. Um, but there's also some additional ones that they want to see for monitoring the air quality from the wood chip plant that we'll be setting up as well. So. There'll be a lot of cast iron that's waste. Does that figure into your scrapping that or somebody scrapping it? Um, somebody can scrap it if they want it. I don't want I'll it. put it in a dumpster for somebody. They can come grab it. <laughs> Now, usually what we work with like an all metals recycling and something, Perfect. and you know, we always have a cardboard, a metal, and a trash receptacle, and we do sort everything out. But yeah, okay. we don't, there's, it's all steel in this place. There's not a whole lot of value in the, the painted steel. So Would you hire any high school kids or? If you got a couple, I would be willing to take a high school kid for the summertime, one or two. We could always use an extra set of hands. Her daughter. I'm not giving. <laughs> yes we usually what we do is uh you know this job would have a main project manager on it that's going to be here probably one or two days a week it would have a site supervisor that um, we have somebody slotted for um i'm looking at probably getting a college intern as well involved in the project so we're gonna, the goal is to have two full-time people here on site through the project um we're kind of going to bounce between this facility, Stockbridge and Rochester, because we're doing kind of similar projects between all three. Um, it is a different subcontractor base for the most part between the three schools. This one's going to be heavy Alliance Mechanical, who's been doing a lot of work in the school district already. Um, we did get competing pricing, but they they had good numbers on the project. So um, and they came highly recommended from doing work here. And we've, we've done work with them in the past there very capable contractor so okay uh, thanks are there any other questions? questions yeah you mind putting up those motions if you did so there's just two different motions one the first one being that you guys would authorize the district to enter into performance contracts with energy efficient investments that's five hundred dollars more than what I said, but essentially that it would be the contract amount of two million one hundred eighty-one thousand five hundred okay. um, per term. And then the second motion is that you guys are essentially authorizing the district to enter into a lease um, for the one million two hundred twenty-five thousand. So we need both these motions. Both the motions. Yep.
And that's for this week or next week? These more for, for now. We do them right now. Yeah. Unless, I mean, if you want to. As, uh, no, you don't want to do it at the big meeting next week. No, this would be us <clears throat> approving it, not the voters. Um, you want to make one? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion at the White River Unified District authorize the superintendent to enter into a performance contract with energy efficient investments for a contract amount not to exceed $2,181,500. I will second it. Is there any discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. And uh, I'll make a motion that the uh, White River Valley Unified District authorized superintendent to enter in a lease agreement with the municipal leasing consultants out of Grand Isle, Vermont, um, for an amount up to one million two hundred twenty-five thousand um, at rate higher or no higher than five percent for up to fifteen years. Oh, this this lease will contain escape clause. All second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, motion. Uh, any opposed? Motion passes. Okay. The escape clause is allows you guys to potentially cancel this in the future if you guys get yeah. out of the lease. So, get out of it. Yeah. yeah. Cool guys. Thanks everybody. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Good luck with the rest of your meeting. Yeah. Okay. Now well, we'll move on to the celebration of learning. We don't have any this time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of already, already yeah. We just celebrate everything. We celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so all right, so it's got the N and A. Okay, and Jamie, you're up. So you have my report in hand. Um, I gave a, a pretty long report on um, the proposed legislation that's currently being considered um, in both the House and Senate Ed committees last night. I'll start with S56 and H208. That is in regards to trying to expand childcare and uh, pre-K programming across the state. The, the big changes there are that four-year-olds would be classified as pre-K and they would, they would be, have the oversight of the agency of education and be required to attend at elementary schools five days a week for full days, which we already do. The other big change though in this proposal is that three-year-olds would not fall under pre-K and would fall under childcare licensing. And they would be overseen by the Department of Children's. Schools mm -hmm. would not receive any credit if they were to take in three-year-olds um, unless a three-year-old was serviced for uh, intensive interventions and supports via an IEP. So they had a triple E. Then they could attend our public pre-K and we would receive a 1.0 for average daily membership. Some board members have asked me, how does this expand programming? Well, I think the thought process is, it, it, we um, as a supervisory union and a, a, the member districts within it offer significantly more pre-k programming in some of our neighbor districts meaning that not all schools right now are providing public pre-k they're just providing vouchers for students to access either other public pre-k's or private pre-k centers so the idea that four-year-olds would all that schools would be required to provide public pre-k five days a week for four-year-olds full days that's that's part of where that's coming from. We're already doing that. The other thought process then is that it would open up room for three-year-olds to attend other private centers. I don't know if that's necessarily true. Um, you know, I think that there's been a lot of testimony on that subject. 
Um, and certainly, as we know, within our SU, there's not a lot of private centers available. Um, so it's certainly a concern there. The, the House and Senate are taking a lot of testimony on this right now. I said last night, I'm not certain that this is going to move out of um, committee. Um, and if it does, I think there's going to be significant change. This These bills were written um, based on a report that the legislature had received about the need to expand child care. Um, and the educational community and early childhood community was not consulted about the bill prior for to it being introduced. Um, and so that's S-56. And Shannon, I think you have a question. Uh, yes, just briefly, does this require all four-year-olds in your district to go to your pre-K? Okay, I just wanted to, because parent choice is still so important with parents. No, it, no you, would, you would have school. to. So let me. It doesn't force students to attend, but you cannot take a voucher and go attend somewhere else. Okay. Yeah, I was just like, for example, someone who works until six, they can still keep their kid in the private day. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stu uh, school age children are not required to attend school until they turn six. S6, any other questions about S56? S66, um, this is a different, this, this bill is different to speak about with, with our White River Unified District because you don't have school choice and the rest of the member districts do. Um, and so S66 is something that I hope that you're all following closely. Um, and what it is, is it's in response to Carson v. Macon in the Supreme Court ruling that said that a, that you, a state agency cannot provide public dollars for independent private schools and disallow public dollars due to the basis of a independent school being religiously affiliated. You can't draw a line and say, as they say, we provide public dollars to independent schools, but we will not allow families to then also take public dollars and go to a religiously affiliated school. That's what Carson B. Macon said. So Montpelier is trying to, um, in response to that, this bill was created to say essentially that school choice districts would send their tuition dollars to public schools or the four historical academies in the state that at one time served as public schools for those towns. That's where they drew the line. So there's there's testimony on this right now. The other big thing that, that it, um, is worth following is that it does require, because currently in statute districts can um, designate up to three schools, and so it uses that language to require school choice towns to designate up to three that would be designated by the school board. Now, I said last night, I do believe there's, I believe this bill is going to be acted on. I think that it could be changed and redrafted, but I believe that there is a desire in Montpelier to have a response to Carson v. Macon. Um, I've been hearing that since the Supreme Court ruling. And it was actually, they tried to get a bill out of committee even last year to deal with it. So I do think there's momentum on this one. It's one that I plan to follow closely. It's one um, that I am getting updates on a regular basis from Executive Director Sue uh, Kozlowski from the VSBA and also the VSA, Jeff Francis. I met with them on Monday about this bill um, because certainly within RSU, um, the big change for many of our families would be the fact that public funds could not then follow as currently drafted to the Sharon Academy. And the Sharon Academy, of course, about 85% of their students are WRVSU students. So that is S66 as currently 
um, constructed. Is there are there any questions on S sixty six? All right, um, and then I'll I'll come on for some other things later in the agenda. But I just wanted to, I put it in my board report, but remind the board that on Monday night for the annual meeting we have three all at the same time essentially um and so tara is going to be in sharon i'm going to be in first branch and onda will be with you and the principals um on monday evening sounds good all right does anybody have any questions for jamie all right thanks jamie Sure. Uh, thank you for welcoming us. There's four of us, as you know. Hi. Hi. Um, it's academic data reporting, right? Well, actually, you have our, our principal report, which is not academic data. We'll get to that after. Some of the highlights from our report that I would want to mention is that our elementary schools, both campuses, have been honored and recognized by the state uh, for our work in PBIS. So that was nice to get a letter from Secretary French on that. Um, I would also add we um, most recently had a nice community builder where our students uh, wrote cards to students in, uh, who are hospitalized. So we're working on kindness and uh, we've done different kindness cards and uh, this was just something different for us to do. So that was a nice experience for them. Uh, our most recent in service, we did a lot of work around writing, and uh, we had done a whole school write all together uh, on the same topic, but uh, in all the way to K through middle school. Uh, and so we analyzed those writing topics and worked on proficiencies. So that was an exciting thing for us to do. We got to look at the writing and talk about how we can do writing better. And then I'd say finally for elementary, we've continued our outreach, and Nancy, you know all about it because we were there. But uh, really thankful to Kathy Fector, who's brought this lens of uh, working with Food Shelf. And also, uh, she saw the middle school was collecting plastic, and she's like, I want to collect plastic. And then I, we were able to donate the, the plastic bench back to the Food Shelf. So that's not nice. Mm -hmm. And then make Valentine's Day uh, cookies with Food Shelf soon thereafter. So. We're excited about all that. You have Valentine's Day cookie update? <laughs> no, but plastic update. We're, we're working on a second bench already. In fact, I filled my car up today, <laughs> which then I transferred into my garage without my husband knowing. So. But yeah, so yeah, plastic, keep it coming. You guys might want to do it in Royalton too. Yeah. It doesn't take long. It takes us about two months to get 500 pounds of plastic. Wow. Which is probably the landfill. Oh, these are beautiful benches. They're beautiful benches. Mm -hmm. I think the kids felt really good about that. That's really good. There it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's it's not, 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 just okay. make one quick comment about that. If her, my parents actually won one of them, and they're sitting, it's sitting on my porch right now, uh, and they are beautiful. Um, they ended up auctioning off one from the Heartland Lions Club at their Valentine's Day dance and made like three or four hundred dollars so yeah um maybe one of our groups that needs money like the, um, the yellowstone group or the national honor society like yeah, i know we, we bring in all our pellet bags and donate them there so um yeah that's a great idea but there's there's a lot of of um desire for those benches in the community not just for some of the community spaces but for people's homes too so I think we've been, you know, using them. I think the middle school has been having them here because yeah. we love them. I'm gonna let Kathy do what she's doing with the elementary side. Uh, how do we how do we donate Oh, there's. <laughs> let me show you. <laughs> On the way out. <laughs> there's bin. There's a big bin in the elementary lobby. If you walk in and you just, even if you can't fit in the bin, just bring your bag and put it by the bin. And it's and it's plastic film. It can't, unfortunately, it's not um, containers, but anything that's film plastic, so pellet bags, yeah. yes. saran wrap, bread we have bags. Our 12th ton of pellets, we have many bags. Oh, uh, no. and we love pellet bags because they're, they're, they're heavy. They're heavy. You yeah. can put it in Jeff's office. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're in your house. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, so from the from the middle school, we kind of capitalized at the mid part of the year, somewhat around the hundred day, but maybe a little bit before that too. Again, kind of tag with what Andrew was saying to really revisit and refocus what we mean when we talk about kindness, responsibility, safety, and respectfulness. And we really tried to reboot setting clarity around what the expectations are for kids and, and having that consistency throughout the school. And I think it's made a tremendous difference. There are still some areas that we need to focus on, um, but really trying to acknowledge and recognize the kids that are always doing what we expect. They're just great citizens. And so acknowledging and celebrating them is something that we've started to, to do a lot more of. And so I think that's been really positive with kids. And it's also made a huge impact on decreasing some behaviors that we might not have wanted happening just because that clarity was helpful. So that would, I would call that a reboot. Um, again, Andrew mentioned the last professional time was focused around writing. Um, and again, just I looked quickly at some of the data. We had some folks who are part of the district team facilitating with the teachers, looking at the fall ass writing assessment that kids did at the middle school. And I mean, overall, I, I thought that there's three areas that they were um, being scored upon, which was organization and purpose, evidence and elaboration and conventions. And my quick, quick estimate of numbers was approximately 50% of the sixth and seventh grade students and 40% of the grade eight students score proficient or distinguished. So those numbers, we want them higher, but they were certainly showing some positive um, positivity and conventions that grammar usage and mechanics was an overall area of strength for seventh and eighth graders. So that's, again, there's gonna be a little bit more on data in some of the other areas, but we did see some improvements in writing. So that was positive. Um, and then just for the, the last thing, we have an upcoming event in a couple of weeks and I was just typing my announcement to go out this week, but again, to con connect with our overall, who we are as a community and really trying to focus on addressing how we treat each other. Um, we have a, a speaker coming called, uh, named Mr. John Halligan. He's been all over the country. He's from Vermont. I'm not sure if he's still from Vermont. Uh, I'll have to ask him when he's here. But he will be doing a parent uh, evening presentation and then a student assembly the next day around the prevention of bullying, cyberbullying, and teen suicide. And we're tagging that with an event on March 14th at Bethel University. So he'll be here first. Hopefully, folks will be able to come, stay for the dinner, and then maybe join Bethel University activities as well. So that's that's from the middle school. Tara has yeah. yeah, Tara, did you have something? <clears throat> Sorry, I just wanted to know if Parker saw the comment that Jamie's locked out and he can't get back in. Can you help him? I was like, what question does Tara have for me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great presentation, Pam. <laughs> I was, how do you get locked out? <laughs> there he is. <laughs> so at the high school, I just uh, we talked a little bit about um, some of the successes earlier. So I just want to say too that we didn't mention those uh, two students just recently graduated from our school. One was a um, student that graduated early, wants to join the Marines. Um, so he did some extra work to get there. Obviously, he graduated early, so that was kind of a proud moment at school. And then the next one was uh, walked last year in June, but didn't receive a diploma. And she worked hard through flexible pathways to receive her, her degree. And that was kind of an exciting moment. So it was kind of first time as principal getting my picture taken with graduates was kind of special. So yeah. Next was um, just some of the data that I wanted to share was uh, two things about seniors. 98% of our seniors are on track to graduate. Uh, we might have to push a few to the finish line, but we're all excited to do that. And another neat uh, percentage is 46% of our seniors are applying to college. So that's pretty good. Did you just bust over to the academic data plan? I did. Yeah. yeah. Kind of okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. We're not there yet. <laughs> all right. I got it done. All right. I also haven't been able to say anything. <laughs> I know. Okay. I, I want to <laughs> step out of it a little bit, but just to um, <clears throat> thank the administrators and most especially Pam for helping support the middle school when I needed to be away. Today's my first day back, and it, it seems to be going well. I'll let you know tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to take that time to thank both uh, Jeff and Andra, and most especially Pam. 
and the board and the superintendent for your support of my needing to take care of personal business. Thank you. Now back to the report. <laughs> We're doing the academic report. Sure. Where do we begin that? It says, Alan, did you kick us off on that? Uh, I am. I would be happy to. But you did. You all. You all know this data as as well as I do. So I'll give a a, a ten second intro that we're reporting in kindergarten through eighth grade on our winter benchmark assessment, which we use Track My Progress. You saw. Uh, similar data in the fall for first through eighth grade. So this is the first time their kindergartners um, were using the Track My Progress uh, to show us uh, what they know in math and English language arts. Um, and then uh, for high school, I think Jeff has given most of the, the highlights there. And we will we are looking at some additional options for high school level assessments for next year. Track My Progress was not an option this year. Um, they may become an option by next year, as well as some um, interim assessments through our new state summative. So we'll have some options there to, to um, look at for high school. But the, for today, we'll look, be looking at kindergarten through eighth grade in math and ELA. And um, there's some really great things to celebrate uh, and some indications of things that we are continuing to work on. So. I can uh, hand it over to whoever um, wants to talk it through from here. I, I met with the principals earlier today. I think, Andrew, you're ready to kick off. I'm ready. If everyone else stops talking, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would say I don't need to go through it graph by graph. I think people can look at graphs for themselves. Uh, my takeaway for elementary is that I'm pleased, and I think all our, our staff is pleased that we do see some improvement with our math scores. Uh, just like I reported in the fall, we have a lot of professional development that our teachers have engaged in. Uh, we also have a lot of teachers who are on their own saying, I want to take more and finding other classes to take. Uh, I know that through that also we had teachers come back and say, we want to do a math night now. So uh, we did a math night here at Bethel Elementary. Teachers from Royalton came over and kind of like watched how, how it rolled out. And I think that we're building our capacity so that maybe every other year we'll offer on each campus and families are able to come play games and take them home and figure out how to like just use a deck of heart cards and like play some fun games and kind of build our skills through that. So that was one really wonderful thing that's come out of that. But feeling good about those math scores and also um, Bonnie Bourne is our SU math coach and we just continue to work with her. And I think having a stronger focus next year on maybe not so many things, but just the math and continue to use our materials that we have that are all aligned and in line with better to help us continue to improve our math skills in general. Thank you. And uh, I think Pam and I will try to do this together. Uh, as I said, I just came back today. <clears throat> but reading the data and also the narrative here, there's a lot of good news for the middle school. And I don't want to overstate it because that's the sort of thing that can bite you next time. But we've already seen increase, and most especially, I believe, in the eighth, seventh, and eighth grade, where uh, or the eighth grade is one quarter of them moved out of well below expectations, and now are meeting expectations. So that's a great uh, increase for us, an important one. We have, when I been out, and Pam can speak to this, we adjusted the schedule, and if you wouldn't mind addressing that a little bit. Yeah, sure. One of one of the things that happened, and I think I shared a little bit of, with the board prior to this, was uh, we adjusted the schedule mid-year, and so our core content classes, but specific, specifically math and literacy, I'll speak to here, are all 60 minutes in length now, and they meet four days a week uh, at 60 minutes, and then Fridays, because we have these half-day professional development they're a little shorter, but they do meet every single day. And so that is not what the schedule looked like before. So we're really proud of that. The schedule is working really well for adults and for kids. That consistency from day to day, I, I believe, has made a huge improvement. And I think we're seeing some of the some of the focus here. And I'm always a believer, you know, percentage points are a piece, but when we can look at lines and graphs and see growth. That's what we want. It may not be as far a leap as we all would like to be, but we are moving in the right direction. So I was really pleased to look at at the track my progress data from and compare it from fall to spring. But that structural change, I think, with the schedule, it is really making an impact on the day to day. I think the same holds true for the literacy also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
so we're going to keep our eye on that and watch that. Um, it's also the second time we've taken track my progress. This this test that's offered to us. So that might be part of kids understanding it a little better too, and teachers as well. So. Yeah, so I would say for the literacy, we're happy that it's holding stable. Um, we're moving into a different approach to teaching literacy, which is much more um, based on foundational skills and explicit teaching of letters and sounds and all, all those things. Uh, so we're definitely needing to do some more training up in that. Uh, I think teachers have to grow a little bit, but there's a lot of questions on that being offered this year. Again, like I had mentioned, the math thing with literacy, but I'm hoping next year focusing on just math and literacy will see even more growth. Yeah. I think we covered it, didn't we? Any questions right now? And of course, always contact us at the school if you have questions. Thank you. Right, thanks. It is great to see um, progress. Uh, we'll take it. So, yeah. Hopefully, that continues on into the spring and, and going forward. That is, uh, Kindergarten math scores are pretty great. <laughs> I know. <laughs> awesome. All right. Cool. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, Tara. Hi, everyone. You have my report, which outlines what's happening in the business office during the month of February. And then I also provided the fiscal year 23 budget projections as of 12 31 2022 which is the close of quarter two and based on the salaries uh, budget versus contracts that have been issued it looks like we're going to have about one hundred and eighty one thousand dollars in savings there and then health insurance um, budgeted versus what enrolled um, we have just over $19,000 in savings there. So those are the two areas that we focus on um, for quarter two. And so the potential area of savings is a combined total, because we also have the um, teacher's retirement. We have more new teachers come in. So we are over budget there by that 17,373. And that's the amount you have to pay every year um, for a new teacher, as long as they're employed in your district. Uh, so we have a potential savings of $183,361 on the expenditure side. And on the revenue side, we did uh, tuition reconciliation in December. And so based on that, we have some additional tuition students um, who joined us. So we've got about $62,000 um, in projected additional revenue and tuition if they all continue and we don't have any students withdraw in the second semester. And in preschool, we also had one additional student enroll versus what we budgeted for. So you'll see that 3656 additional revenue there. And then um, we haven't gotten anything yet for the um, adult learning, which that's hit or miss if we get it each year. So with the projected revenue surplus and the projected expenditure surplus, we're looking at a projected surplus right now of $226,017. And I have not updated this, the bottom section. That will be updated once um, we get all the final audits. Any questions? All right, thanks, Tara. All right, uh, I see full board updates. Um, um, yeah, so, do you want to do it, Rodney? And uh, no, you can go ahead. So the the full board did take action last night. To um, we have put our transportation <laughs> services contract out for bid. We had received one bid. Um, the board rejected that bid um, last night and empowered uh, me to pursue any and all other opportunities to come back to the full board um, this coming month, um, hopefully with some additional bids 
and also costing out what would uh, transportation cost in the event that the board decided to pursue transportation services um, on their own. And so you will see that in the notes. So I did want to just mention that um, and, um, and leave it at that. Most of that conversation happened in the executive session. Um, and the, the other full board updates was um, we had reviewed our track my progress data across the SU. I encourage you to take a look at that to see that there is growth happening um, specifically in mathematics across the SU. And just wanted to emphasize the fact that, you know, we are making a transition from our approach of um, Fountas and Pinnell, which is more whole language based approach to literacy instruction to uh, a much more focused approach in regards to foundational skill literacy. Um, and so there's been a lot of new materials um, purchased over the last year in training for teachers so that we can strengthen um, our approach to phonics and phonemic awareness um, instruction at the primary grades. Um, and, you know, I, I'm happy to send out to the board. There's There's been a ton of research that's come out over the last um 15 months in regards to uh the importance of teaching phonics and phonological awareness and um it is something i had mentioned when you first hired me as a superintendent and it's taken a little time but we have been making that shift now um away from the use of fountas uh panel materials all right thanks All right, uh, policy committee. So, first reading of the board member civility policy and um, reading number one for the special education policy. Um, have people had a chance to look these over? Does anybody have any comments? I think the one in the civility is going back for our amendment. Yeah, we were, yeah, Rod, right. we were back at the full board last night with a desire to for the policy committee to look at how can we be more specific about defining um, board business. So I think uh, approach that we may use is to try to define board business um, to make it clear that you may be conducting board business, not necessarily at a meeting um, if you're taking up board business. Um, for example, I think a good example is like, um, the walkthrough you just talked about at the school, that would be board business. That's official board business. Or if you're discussing something that has to do with the school district, you are in fact representing the board. Um, so anyways, board members wanted that, that better defined. So that's something that the policy committee, I'll try working on that and then present a new draft to the policy committee um, at the March meeting. But there's other feedback on this too. I, I think Rodney and I both would greatly appreciate it. What's that? I know you skipped that one for a second too. Do, do you know, uh, Jamie, would drafting or would this first draft has has this committee looked at the the template that's available through um, VPA that they have for code of conduct? Yeah, no, we, uh, um, a bunch of our boards have already adopted um, the VSBA code of conduct, um, but that doesn't provide censor. So I think that there was a desire for, I had heard from the boards to have some type of what happens if a board member doesn't abide by the policy. Now, the committee has not thought about the idea of meshing the two, and there could be an opportunity to, to do that. Cause, and the only reason why I ask is if if you look at the VPA's one that I have a copy of, it, it does help with laying out um, a board member's conduct in certain areas of, you know, what we would say meeting versus non-meeting areas. Um, and it's not just strictly due to behavior as well. There's other things that come in there about, you know, following applicable laws and policies and procedures and confidentiality and you know there's a lot of other pieces that um goes into that code of conduct 
um, rather than just behavior. Um, and then they do have a, I guess the comment, I, the biggest comment I had was, I'd like to see a more clear roadmap on how to deal with the behavior when it happens. And it seems like right now it's really open, you know, uh, if there is a sample process in the BPA where it kind of tells, uh, for instance, that uh, this is a BPA template that, you know, the, the first time that the board chair would issue a, a document, a written notice of alleged misconduct to the board member, you know, to explain what you did. And then the board member would have the opportunity to, um, to dispute that. Um, and then after three document instances, then, then it lays out a more specific roadmap, um, which one would be a uh, board level discussion of misconduct, including a possible vote to censor that person, um, or two communication of misconduct to the community represented by the board member. So that would be, we'll call it more of an apology letter that they would have to uh, conduct short, uh, to the community. <clears throat> And then three, you know, on more egregious type thing would be that the board would ask for a formal request that the person resign from the board's position. Um, so I, I just think is, the way this is under the VPA, Chris. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's VPA. I can send you the copy. I got it from the, the executive director there, um, but it just lays out. It, it, I think that the challenge, or <coughs> the concern I have is a board either board now or board 30 years from now is you know so it doesn't have to be subjective to the board it's it's more of a you know your behavior was here and this is you know according to our policy this is exactly what the step is um i think the sensor could be you know do you censor the person or do you not censor the person and then it becomes you know does the board want to censor the person and how many people vote yes versus no where if you have it right in your policy saying if you do this this will be you know, regardless of what the board says, you know, the first step will be you'll get a letter of written reprimand from the board chair or, you know, something something we fall back on, I, I think. Um, but I'll send you the copy. It's a two page document. You got that from Jay? No, I got it. Uh, maybe it was uh, I got it from I'll, I'll send the I'll send the email. I got it from it was a uh, executive be, director, a lady. Um, that's maybe Sue. Was, yeah, Sue. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So the the other policy, the special education policy, um, we've been talking about. And if you have the time to read um, Special Services Director Miss Rhodes' um, board report, she's been trying to provide updates monthly to the board about how special education laws have changed with the enactment of the new special education law that took effect July 1. Part of this was a requirement for the SU to adopt a special education policy. And so this policy um, is boilerplate of, uh, in regards to what the agency expects us to have on the books. Um, and so there's one change that was made after um, consultation with legal. And it's the sentence that says, along with relevant regulations and applicable laws. And that was added in the event that for some reason, the special education procedures and practices manual that the state adopts was in conflict with federal regulations, that it's clear in our policy that we would not just go by that manual, but that we would, of course, always use other relevant regulations and applicable laws, meaning federal, um, in regards to our work around special education. Um, so this is a policy that I'm hopeful that we could get first readings this month and start taking action um, as a full board in March, because that will be their second reading so that we can get this in place um, here really over the next 45 days. Yeah, I would just say have a comma instead of a period before the along with relevant re regulations. Oh, yes, thank you. But other than that, looks good. All right. Any other comments on the two policies? All right, then um, 
I don't think we have any task force updates today, do we? <clears throat> so we'll move on to um, policy adoption. <clears throat> uh, act to adopt the flag policy. <clears throat> Any motion on this? You want to have a motion before a discussion, or sure. Before I make a motion that we approve the flag policy. That's written. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? I, I I know we I think the good faith was that you know we had looked at this back in I don't know April or May May I think it was May and or May is when this journey started and you know that this potentially was going to go to the SU to have a policy to come back um, that could be then administered by the districts and and some I'm reading the policy and I'm kind of like well they made a policy to say that. The districts, make the, the districts make the policy. However, they're going to tell us what we may or may or shouldn't put in it. Or, you know, so I'm like, why even adopt it? At this point, it's we're going to adopt the SU policy because they're going to tell us that we have to then adopt our own policy. That here's some pieces that we can put in it, but it's up to you. So, at that point, is why don't we not adopt this policy? Why don't we? Put together our own committee in house and put forward our own policy on it. Well, I mean, is there anything objective? Just, just to just, but you would. I just have to speak up. You'd be in violation of policy. The S. You have a district policy that policy comes out of the SU. That that would be why. So I mean, you'd be breaking that policy to do that. I mean, I think the the goal is that we don't want to have a bunch of different rules that the SU office has to navigate through. Um, you know, if there's something we don't, we object to with this, then we should get it so that it's changed SU wide, and then we can our individual policy the way we want it to. Um, but then Jamie kind of knows what the common guidelines are for the five flag policies, and then each to get connected. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm just speaking to you as a SU board and district board. You have a policy called the development of policies. I I know, and I'm saying that's why we have it. Right. Um, and so you know, this one it does say that we individual districts adopt individual different things. It's not exactly its own policy, but like, yeah. Really, what you would adopt if you read this policy would be whether or not you permit flags to be flown on flagpoles or de in other designated locations that that is why it's written this way is that there wasn't consensus among districts of whether or not flagpoles could be a designating location for a student group to sponsor a flag Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't read it that way. So I guess that's the, the challenge for me is that that the SEO has laid out a policy, but then the opening paragraph says that this policy is to be adopted by the SU, but then it's up to each individual district to to adopt its own flag bond policy. So, right, but consistent with the procedures set for right. it. I, I, so. think, I think the portion of it, and I said this back in November, that I don't like about it is is the decision to put whatever it is, any symbol that one wants to create, it becomes a subjective matter to the board and to whoever the superintendent is. So, um, I mean, even though you may have some templates of uh, that something might um, fall within, it's still, you know, someone could present a symbol or a flag that meets the criteria that then either the superintendent decides they don't like it or it goes to the board and the board says they don't like it. And I think the, the case that we have here is, you know, uh, there has been a Supreme Court case about 
you know, fairness of the policies of, you know, if it's open for one, it's open to all um, within reason. Um, and I think what it does, it puts a li lot of liability on us uh, and a lot of subjectivity in those decisions now and in the future of, you know, of any type of proposal that we put forward. Um, I think that's the piece of it that, you know, I had, I know I brought up back in November the potential of teaching our children in school a little democracy and put it before the school children to vote on um, rather than uh, five adults that may be stuck in their ways on whatever whatever it is of the day. So uh, that I can't get behind it as, as long as it's still subjective on who's going to say yes or no to these these things because this is going to change over the years depending on who's in power of the government at the school end of things. Go ahead, Chairman. I'd like to clarify that the lawyer did look at the Supreme Court decision and said that does not apply here. Boston was doing something very different with the flagpole that we are doing here. Yeah, I'd like to clarify that I, I said the Supreme Court decision as well as other subjective decisions. Does anybody else have comments or discussion on, on the motion? Um, I, I, I'm I, when I was reading it, I was confused in that when when a student group or whatever wants to fly a flag, do they go through their school district or does the request go to the superintendent? So they, it comes to me and then if it meets the criteria laid out, I bring it to you. It doesn't go to the SU board, it goes to you. And if I felt like the criteria wasn't met, they can appeal that decision to the board. Um, if I was to deny a request, they have an ability to appeal it to you. I would say if you don't want to fly flags, you can always approve this policy and we just say as a district, we don't want to fly flags. Correct. Um, so, you know, there's nothing that says that we have to fly flags if we adopt this policy or approve flags or whatever. Um, And yeah, oh, they, there's a part of me that, that thinks it's it's good to have a district wide policy, but then I'm also thinking that our superintendent already has to do a ton of work as it is, and now he or she would have to start approving flag requests. Shouldn't that be done if it eventually comes back to the district, the school district itself? Why don't, why don't we just go through the school district and the school district should follow the policy of the, of the whole organization? I mean, I would think it's just because Jamie is ultimately, um, you know, kind of the, the top of the top of the pole there. So. I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I realize he's top of the food chain, but I'm assuming he has better things to do than approve flag requests. But I mean, well, I like, actually be approving them. I'd just be making certain there was criteria and putting it on your agenda, like how I plan your agenda now with with Andrew. And there's nothing that says that you can't delegate most of it to somebody else and then they, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, and just so the board knows, I mean, this has been adopted by the SU and all the other member districts of the SU. You would be the final one to make a decision on this. We have had multiple readings of this, so I think, you know, we're kind of late in the time period here to be bringing up modifications. Um, so uh, is there any more discussion or are we ready to have a vote? 
Okay, so one last question. So if we adopt this policy, the SU policy, the current policy, the way it's written, has language in there to follow this set procedure. So when, when as a board, would we then sit down to talk about if we want to actually follow the policy? Yeah, I mean, I think I guess it's kind of the. I think we put on a future agenda item of deciding what our designated flag place would be, or you know, posting area. Or, or if you're just not going to have, yeah, you can really. It's it's you really, choosing your location. And so, why don't we? We'll put that on for either next month or the month after, and we can think about. What the preferences are, and we can have a discussion and see if we can come to consensus that time. And, and from what I saw in here, it did, it did allude to that you could pick a flagpole or designate an area of the school, or it doesn't have to necessarily be outside, right? Correct. So, so what? Yeah, I'll take this up as a separate item. But so, what happens with the symbols or flags that are currently in classrooms? Are those in breach of the current policy? Andrew, go ahead. I think um, I think I might understand what you're saying. Like, if somebody had say uh, <clears throat> some sort of flag in their classroom, it probably likely would be part of what they're teaching, whether it's in the. Actually, I would, I'd like to answer. Wait, I'd like to answer this. My answer would be yes, Chris. It, once this policy is adopted, and you designate a location, yes, it would be in violation of the policy. So then those teachers or whatever would have to formally well the students well, well yeah student groups putting up posters or no i'm just curious because if you go posters into, are different right okay. then if if someone was flying a flat putting a flag if you designate a location for banners or flags that is where they would be it wouldn't be just you you put them up in different classrooms Go ahead, Chairman. Can I um, ask for a distinction because the flag policy specifically does not apply to flags of any nationality. So, like in the language room, I know we're flying some flags of different language, different countries. Is that still allowed? Are we going to make them all take those down? Mm -hmm. I, I was. I think. I need I don't have the it's nine o'clock. I don't have the policy in front of me, but I would tell you right now when people have asked me to fly flags that weren't related to a country, my answer has been no, that we are currently pursuing a flag policy. <coughs> Just so the board's clear, that is what I've said when I've been asked. Right. Okay. So we're we just had like flags and banners, but like if somebody wants to put up a banner for the homecoming dance, that doesn't necessarily count, right? Yeah. Symbolic flags or banners. Um, well, shall we vote at this point or does anybody have any further comments? All right. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. I'll vote aye as well. Any opposed? I'm just going to sustain from there. Okay. And abstentions? Yeah. Okay. okay. The flag policy is adopted. Okay. Move on to final planning and preparation for the annual school district meeting. Um, so it'll be in the Royalton gym. Um, is there specific things we want to talk about for planning and preparation? Um, one thing that did come up, um, there was somebody commenting on, on Facebook about um, accommodating people who might not want to attend due to health reasons. Like, does anybody have any ideas of how we can try and accommodate 
like I was thinking maybe we had like a social distancing section where we put chairs a little spread out so that if people want to try and come and be spread out then like not being where the chairs are a little more crowded might be a way of coming. I think the plans to host in the large gym this year. Is that correct, Jeff? Yep, it is. Okay. Yeah, so we there should be chair. plenty. So yeah. somebody can take a chair and move them on the social distance. Yeah, I didn't know, like I was thinking if we just had a designated social distancing section, then people will know like don't go sit next to these people. And we have the we'll put them all yeah. on an island. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Most of the seating will be, but if you want some yeah. separate seats on the side, you could do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you, you know, based on current, you know, typical attendance to, this, you know, you're talking, I think, you know, 200 people, maybe. And, you know, usually at the athletics, I mean, you can fit 500 people yeah. in there and you're not sitting on each other's right. lap. But right. so I got to think that if you're, you know, a third of that, you, you have enough that you could space out, you know, yeah. five or six feet or, or. Yeah, I'm just thinking if we had a section for people who are particularly concerned yeah. about it, then it might make them more likely to will to attend for a month. So, the one thing I have um, is there any comments on the, like, I assume we'll do something similar to what we did tonight. Um, the one thing I had, I thought your celebrations and, and presentations were great. The one thing I would say is um, just to explain some of the terminology like uh, sure. right, and the, the uh, goals, particularly, like when we're talking about multi-tiered systems of support, like we've heard of a million times, but I know lots of people don't know what that means. Good point. Um, but other than that, I thought it was... I, I just wanted to make certain we're still good with a moderator and everything like yeah i need to make sure uh, i think um i need to reach out to allison to see if she's willing to do it as she has in the past and I, I knew she had i just thought we should check in with her just to make certain i need to do that i haven't done that yet um we have checked in with the board clerk i believe and is the treasurer willing to do it again has anybody checked in tara yeah. pam is set to be treasurer and clerk again so someone just has to appoint her or nominate her i mean okay all right is there anything else for that. <coughs> okay. All right. And uh, is there any public comment at this time? Go ahead. It's Ed Sullivan again, uh, potential candidate for school board. Um, on the, as a potential candidate in the next couple of weeks, week or so, uh, listening to the civility policy, as I got to the, the back, um, just to make sure the impetus isn't to, to censor anybody inappropriately, it says, you know, conduct business or prohibited from engaging in conduct or speech that's disrespectful, offensive. As this stands, uh, that needs to be uh, very much laid out better so that this can't be used as a tool just to be the popular uh, what, what is disrespectful or what is offensive it has to be pretty clearly laid out because if you're going to censure somebody you have to actually define beforehand what's in that category so it needs to be very clear what you can and cannot say in your capacity as a personal citizen and, and as a board member and when so this is a little bit uh, a vague and the possibility of censure can't be uh, something that can be just, just be done because people don't like what is being said or people don't like you exercising rights in another part of your life. So um, I would just encourage uh, both the board and, and the SU to define that further. Thank you. <coughs> Any other public comment? All 
All right. Um, do we have any new hires or reservations? Okay. No, but we are we are starting to get job postings up. So, in regards to like the just positions that we know if we have a retirement or something that we might be expecting. So, know that I'm hopeful that we're going <laughs> ahead of the curve and that we'll have some new hires hopefully for you here in the next month. Yeah, great. Um, I don't think we have any other uh, future agenda items. Um, Chris had requested a, that we revisit the articles of agreement to look at how we have the district structured. Um, so our next meeting date, well, we have our annual meeting on the 7th um, or 6th at 7 o'clock in the Royal Tomb. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jim, and our next regular meeting will be Tuesday, March 21st at 6 30 at the Royalton campus. I entertain a motion to adjourn. I have a quick clarification. We are still waiting on the what Jamie learned from looking at the articles of agreement for merging the elementary schools and the thoughts around that. So that was something we were looking at the articles for. And we had uh, postponed that till next month. Just, to... Andrew? Just making sure it doesn't get lost. <laughs> it's Monday, the 6th. Yes. It says 6 p.m. Okay, 6 p.m. Sorry. I just won't, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but you no, said it's in, the, in the presentation. It's accurate. Okay. I was misstating. 6 p.m. is the end 6 p.m. on the 6th. Okay. 6 on the 6th. Okay. All right, now.